Hello and welcome to the Next Level Podcast. I'm Tim Miller, uh, here for an exciting Sunday show. Uh, we're deciding to do something a little bit different. We've been trying to make these Sunday shows a little bit lighter fare, bringing for people from outside of politics. Uh, but given the unbelievable news out of Tennessee with first the horrific shooting and then the expelling of two black state reps uh, from the, the House uh, we decided we wanted to do something a little bit more on the news, and we are so blessed and lucky to have the third member of the Tennessee Three, State Rep Gloria Johnson, uh, who survived the expulsion vote, uh, but is still very much you know, tied to the efforts in Tennessee to, to pass gun reform, to push back against the anti-democratic activities um, of of the Republican supermajority in the state house. Um, it's a great conversation. I hope you'll stick around for it. Uh, and then we'll be back with you Wednesday for a regular next level, uh, with JVL and Sarah. Uh, so up next, Gloria Johnson, but first our friends at acid Representative Johnson, thank you so much for doing this. I know you've got to be unbelievably busy. Uh, we're grateful to have you on the Bulwark. In the green room, you said I could call you Gloria. Is that okay? Can we do Gloria? Absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you for having me. Thank you. I, now, you're pretty busy, so I'm guessing you did not see that uh, uh, RuPaul crowned a new drag superstar last night, Sasha Colby. You were not able to watch no, the I RuPaul's Drag Race that. finale? Okay, well, I figure you never know. I thought maybe you might have, you know, taken a break after a long week and flipped it on. Oh, are no, we worried in? Are we worried in Tennessee? I want to obviously we're going to get to the news of the week, but I, I want to just start start here though. Are you wor- Are we worried that we couldn't have drag events now in Tennessee? Can you talk to us about what's happening with that with that bill? Um, you know, in the. Uh, we're, we're coming. We're do, we're taping this on Saturday morning, right? So, um, uh, you know, morning after usually, you know, there's a world tour. You know, we celebrate our new drag queen. I, Nashville seems like a natural place to stop. Is that even going to be allowed? What What are the What are the rules now? And in, in, um, in the free was from the free speech party in Tennessee. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, it's it's really strange. It's it, the bill is interesting. It's confusing. Uh, very poorly written. We pointed that out over and over. Um, But there's a lot of confusion on what is allowed and what isn't. And so typically your nighttime in the club drag show is fine to go on. Um, You know, they say their big concern is safety of children. Yet what we see in policy across the state has no concern whatsoever with safety of children. So it's kind of hard to believe what they tell you. Um, but they're talking about is Hooters well, still legal in in Tennessee? I haven't been to Tennessee in a while. Have you shut down? Have the Republicans shut down the Hooters, or is that still? Uh, are those, no, those, they those? have not. As a mm. matter of fact, and if you have been to drag shows, as I have, you know that they're wearing lots of layers and lots of clothes. <laughs> and um, you know, I, I always bring the point because in Knox County, where I live, we have a WWE wrestler as mayor. And drag queens wear mo- more clothes than he did in wrestling, um, including a skit where he took his opponent, handcuffed him to the rails of the ring, um, hooked him up with jumper cables to a battery, poured up water over him, and he hooked the, the jumper cables to his testicles and electrocuted him. But apparently mm. drag is bad. So, and, and a WWE event is... That feels prurient to me. <laughs> it does that feels feel a little prurient. prurient. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, We're talking about WWE, which is at least a third full with children. You who know? is the mayor? I didn't know that you had a wrestler he is, mayor. The man is Kane. Oh, um, Kane! I did know this. <laughs> Kane, the Undertaker's brother, is the mayor now. Yes, yes, and he also did. He also did a skit where I mean, this. My goodness, when I found out about it, he he's complaining about drag. He did a skit where his girlfriend had died, and um, she was in a coffin, and he. Pretended like he was having sex with her dead body in the coffin as one of the skits. Ugh. But drag is bad. 
<sighs> well, I mean, you can we can joke about it, and there's a lot to make fun of them uh, on this point. But um, it is I, I get a little bit worried about pride coming up in all these states, right? Yes. I, I got into this with Sarah Huckabee's staff wrote an article about this Arkansas is a similar bill, and mm-hmm. you know they were like, "Well, no, we're not trying to ban pride." I'm like. Well, have you ever been to a Pride? I, you know, I, there's some stuff that is happening there that somebody might think, you know, isn't appropriate for kids. Now, I, you know, I think parents have a right to decide whether or not to bring their kids to Pride and like what's a, which part of which functions are appropriate for them. But, uh, you know, you could very, I think it's very reasonable to think that gay Pride might be in threat in, in certain counties in Tennessee, certain parts of Tennessee. I, I, no, absolutely. And because, you know, we have pride floats and there are drag queens on the float and they are dancing. Right. So you're talking about dancing and music. But I've had people send me pictures of just uh, drag queens and saying this is obscene. A picture of them fully clothed is obscene. You know, so yeah. what are we talking about here? It's It has such a chilling effect. And we just had a situation where... Um, I think it was Williamson County uh, was they had a the the prod group had applied for their um, permit for the parade. And it, it took the, the mayor voting to get them over the top to be able to get to have the parade. However, after he voted for it, he said, you know, if you do this, this, this and gave a long list like. You are on a very short leash, and if you step across the line, that's it. You know, so <laughs> it is remarkable. It is just Orwellian that, like, the free speech party here, the party that cares about children, is you know going after you guys for trying to try to uh, make kids safer in schools, going after drag, yeah. you know, despite like getting on their high horse about cancel culture and all this. It's just it is unbelievable. Okay, let's let's get to the actual business um, here. The uh, you know, just for listeners, I think maybe some of them like me, you know, saw the news of what happened with all you guys and, and like we're catching up to it a little bit late, right? I obviously saw the news about the Covenant, the horrific Covenant shooting. Uh, let's just start with, and you kind of walk us through what, ha- you know, the shooting happens at the school and then what happens that leads to you guys getting on the floor that then leads to the expulsion or I guess the expulsion attempt in, in your case. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's it was before the Covenant shooting, of course. I'm a teacher, been at a school that had a school shooting. Um, you know, now which this, I'm sorry to interrupt, but which school was that? I literally I saw you say that in another interview, and I googled it, and it's like there have been multiple school shootings in Knoxville. So it's like, right. It cent- I know, which is horrible was, about like American life. Was it Central High or was it one of the other? It was Central High School in 2008. I taught special ed, and it was one of the special ed students who who was killed, Ryan McDonald. Uh. And uh, he was not my student, but knew him knew him well. He was kind of a a, a, a prankster. He was a funny kid, uh, liked to do jokes and stuff like that. But um, you know, once you have seen th- the terror on kids' faces when that happens, it happened in our cafeteria in the morning, right before everybody went to class when they were having breakfast. And so I'm getting my classroom ready, and I just look up the hill to the doors of, of the school. And they open up and kids are running out screaming and crying and terrified. Uh. And they're coming running into my classroom. And it was a few minutes before I could even get them to articulate to me what happened. And then it was just, you know, hour, a couple of hours spent trying to calm them, trying to let them know that they were safe, figuring out, you know, how we're going to get parents to, to the school and, and how we're going to get everybody home. And it, it was just so much trauma for those young people, for the staff as well, but just for those kids. I mean, this generation currently that are so vocal about gun violence have had to grow up knowing that school shootings happen everywhere and they can happen anytime. When I was in school, that was not a worry we had. That was not a thought that was there. And and this is literally, you know, something they think about every day when they walk in those doors. I, you know, the unbelievable thing just thinking is hearing, <laughs> hello, kitty. <laughs> the unbelievable thing. Uh, what's the cat's name that's joining us? Cats. Cat. Cat the cat. That's a good <laughs> name. Um, the 
the unbelievable thing hearing about the trauma of of what you guys went through at Central and and just who that experience is like that that doesn't even make a mark on our national dialogue anymore, right? Like I I didn't even remember that shooting, and it's just just a it's a horrible um, testimony to kind of what life is like here, and and I, I think kind of speaks to why. We do need action, right? I mean, is that, uh, did you try to bring that to the conversation at all before, you know, you were silenced? Always. I mean, um, you know, I try to bring that up. And then just within a couple of years of that, we had the uh, one of our elementary feeder schools that um, in, in the central area, we had two principals shot at the elementary school. Um by a teacher, actually, who was being told that they weren't going to be coming back, went out to his car, got a gun, came back in, and shot two principals. And um, they had very serious life-threatening injuries, but they did survive and are, are you know, doing okay now. So um, yeah. it, it, it just, it's so prevalent. And they just don't I feel like they think it's not going to happen to them or someone in their family for some reason I don't know why they think they're immune because none of us are immune and um, um they just have no empathy and understanding of what these kids and teachers and and principals and staff go through every day so did you uh, so take us back then again so the covenant shooting happens horrific shooting <laughs> Like what, what happened in the intervening period between that, you know, those horrible deaths, those little babies and, and, you know, what got you guys to the house floor? Yeah, we, you know, we have, it's just been a cycle of them silencing our voices, cutting our mics, all of that. And so, you know, we want the opportunity to have conversations about gun violence and they are just not interested in having those conversations at any time. And anytime we try to bring it up, they'll say, well, we're off the bill, or it's not the time to talk about that. And then that morning, when we went to the floor, um, one of our members who, that's his district, he did speak to to Covenant specifically and, and what happened there, and we sort of acknowledged them and acknowledged the children and the staff that died. But we normally have what we call welcoming and honoring in the morning. And after they he finished talking about covenant, there was no welcoming and honoring. And it was our intention to welcome um, the families and the protesters and the kids that were there, thousands that were gathered in the gallery, in the rotunda, and then out on Legislative Plaza. And several that I knew, um, several staff had reached out to me because I'm a teacher from Covenant. And um, just people that we knew who were there, we wanted to recognize them. We wanted to say, you know, these protesters are here because they're concerned about the safety of their children. And these children are here because they're concerned about the safety of themselves and their peers. And we just wanted to recognize that they were there, recognize the issue that they cared about, and let them know that we were there for them. We wanted to do something, and we were going to do everything we can to do something. And we were not given that opportunity. My other colleagues, uh, both Justins, tried to get it in um, in speaking on a bill. They would speak on a bill and at the end of that say, I'd like to recognize, and they'd get gaveled down for being out of order. And um, then another time, I had my hand raised for quite some time because it was a voucher bill, which is something I'm passionate about, I wanted to speak on. And they didn't, they wouldn't call on me to speak. And so and this that's going on for how long? Decided. This was going on for a couple of days between after the shooting. Well, how long did this? this was in this one morning. We had tried to talk to it before and got, got shut down. Yeah. But this, this was just this one day in session, the day that we went to the well. Got it. And it was at, I think it was right after that voucher bill when we said we just got to do something. And, um, and so we decided, uh, one member had just finished running their bill. We decided between bills to walk up to the well. And that's what we did. So, so, so are you guys on the floor having this conversation? Are you kind of, are you, are you meeting yeah. by the Snickers machine? Take me, take us behind <laughs> the scenes. Like, how did you decide to do it? 
and it, everybody kind of gathers around my desk. My desk yeah. is up front. And so just the well is just to the side. And so the, the two Justins were at my desk and, and we just were saying, this is crazy. They're not letting us talk. You know, these people are standing out here. They want to be heard. They want us to say something about gun violence. Yeah. And so we went to the well. Um, did you, when you went there, did you have any expectation that they, that these guys would respond like as insanely as they did? I, I never thought they would sp- respond so insanely. I mean, it's, it's just outrageous how far they went. I thought there would be a reprimand, you know, the, at the most, I thought we might lose our committees for the rest of this year. You know, yeah, right. that's what I thought. Um, never in my wildest dreams because of, things I have seen on the floor, did I think that they would try to expel us. Now, understand that before, you know, the two Justins just got there this year. I have been there and I have been extremely vocal. A a couple of years ago, I stood on the floor with my hand raised for 45 minutes on an abortion bill and the speaker refused to call on me. Um, And that sort of gave me prominence across the state because people were horrified that one of the few women on the floor was not allowed to talk on that bill. And then, um, and then a couple of years ago on the vote on the Republican speaker, I was the only member to vote. No, Um, I'm just not voting for someone who tried to keep the bust of Nathan Bedford Forrest in our (laughs) capital or somebody who has uh, stopped Medicaid expansion for 10 years. And so I was the only no vote. And I was given a closet for an office. Yeah, I read about that. (laughs) And you ended up giving the closet to your staffer and you and you worked in the hallway or something like that. Well, no, (laughs) then they told me I'd be arrested if I had my desk in the hallway. So I went back into the closet and I said, I need a place for my staffer. So instead, and, and, and mind you, across the hall is the empty office. There's an empty member office across the hall from my my closet office. They built in the alcove next to it, they built uh, a smaller office. It cost $10,000 to build that little um, office that the, the um, when the news crew came, they said it's, a, it's exactly the size of a, a prison cell. Ha- but um, it's just I go, with the way that they funny. abused you like that, like it has to be kind of gratifying just to see <laughs> how much of a fool they've made of themselves over the past two weeks. I, I think that maybe right. you tell me this is my theory. I, I'd love to hear your take. You're with these guys every day. Do you get in this bubble? You know, they're in their little MAGA bubble. Right. And and like the yes. the, the idiotic opinions they have and rationalizations like sound good in the little boys club. You know, and then and then when you when the cameras get there and and the whole world has a chance to see it. I mean, we the whole got a chance to hear it uh, at the Tennessee holler audio of them talking about this vote to expel. I mean, I read that. I was like, it sounds like, you know, Veep meets Django Unchained. I mean, like these guys (laughs) are just dumb. And and there's like obviously some racist and sexist undertones to all this overtones, really. And it's just like. I, I, they thought it made sense, but they're just so enclosed in this little MAGA bubble. They didn't realize how how stupid they were going to look. Is that is that your sense, or do they, or are they just drunk with power since they have the supermajority now? Like like what made them be do so much self harm here? It it's really all of those things. They literally think that they cannot be touched, and um, so there's the drunk with power aspect. But they're also just they're really not that bright. I mean, this brought the world, you know, this brought sunlight into that room. And I love it so much that the world literally saw what was going on in the Tennessee house. And that call to me, and I, you know, I know people aren't going to like it when I say it, but it sounds like a bunch of Confederates strategizing the civil war to say that we are enemies and that there is a war that is such a disservice to the people who want us to come to the table and, and write policy that helps Tennessee families. 
This is a great point. Who are the enemies, by the way? This is a great point. I'd love to have the chance to be able to press one of those guys. I wish that one of them would be willing to come, you All know, right. talk in a in a in a non safe space in a non mega safe space. Because it's like, are the kids there protesting the enemies? Like, who's part of this war? Right? Are the people who don't want to get shot up in their school the enemies? Are the you know, are my people, the never Trump Republican moms who are like, or dads for that matter, are like, I, I wish we had less government and smaller taxes, but like, we need some sane policy. Are they the, like, who, like, who do they see are the enemies in the Civil War? Everyone in Nashville and Memphis, all the black people in Memphis, maybe, are their enemies? <laughs> I don't know. Right? Anybody who doesn't agree with them. It, it's, it's shocking to me because when Democrats win, I don't expect that everybody in my district agrees with me now. They think if they win, well, okay, you have to agree with us now. There's no dissension. Um, we won. What are you doing? You can't disagree with us. And they're terrified of of debating their bills because, well, they're so terrible, but they will not allow discussion on bills. It's just remarkable to me how ridiculous. And And when you talk about being in that bubble, literally, I think most of these folks don't live in the real world. They... They go to their Republican meetings and they go to their churches and they hang with each other. You know, I'm a Democrat in deep red East Tennessee, and every part of my day is is hanging out with Republicans and interacting with Republicans, including my entire family. I mean, you, you know, this is, but that's not they, what they do every day. And it's obvious that they don't understand and they don't care what the majority of Tennesseans want, because Democrats, we are fighting for Medicaid expansion. We're fighting for people to have health care. We're fighting for public education. And our governor and supermajority want to bring in this Hillsdale junk. And we're fighting for paid family leave, cannabis reform, uh, higher wages. Every single one of those things that I named are overwhelmingly supported by both parties yet they will entertain none of them. They won't even let them out of subcommittee. And, yeah. um, but they are doing the bidding of the billionaire special interest. It's NRA and the Tennessee Firearms Association. If you've heard that guy, wow. I haven't heard that guy, but I know I just wrote about the Colorado version of him. So if there's anything, it's probably worse. And uh, so I get the gist, but I I want to um, just really quick. I do want to credit you with your not you. you You're pretty close to directly quoting all the president's men there with uh, the truth is these are not very bright guys and things got out of hand as an explanation for that was the Watergate (laughs) explanation as the explanation for their strategy. But I want to I wanted to ask you about this. You are you're in Knoxville right now. You're beaming in from there. We, We have the. You said you you're, you engage with a lot of Republicans in deep red Tennessee. There's this, I think, a lot of national Democrats. I feel like I, being a former Republican, I have this kind of thing. I can see things a little more clearly sometimes, or or maybe that that's wrong. So I want to hear your take. But a lot of Democrats are scared to go at the gun issue because they've just been bit. You know, they're snake bit on it. And I'm just, I think the 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 game has changed a little bit. I just all of these shootings and, and, you know, I'm not saying you're going to win over the Tennessee gun guys. Right. But I think that there are Republican voters who think some reasonable reforms, red flag laws, right. Certain, you know, there's certain reasons, making sure teenagers can't buy assault rifles. Right. Like, and that yeah. these can be a winning issue. And I'm just wondering, is that, do you feel that way? Have you been hurt hearing from people who are Republicans, I'm sure you've been hearing from some Republicans saying you nasty names, but have you been hearing from Republicans who appreciate what you've been doing? I hear from far more Republicans that appreciate what I'm doing than Republicans who are opposed. I can promise you that. And and this is not new to me. I've always advocated for gun sense legislation. I've brought two red flag laws and had them killed on a party line vote. Um, and because it is an important issue to me, um, last year when I was running, I pulled this issue. In Red Knox County, in my district, I pulled um, red flag laws and safe storage. Those are typically the bills that I carry, uh, red flag law and safe storage. And I pulled those in my district. Overwhelmingly, the vast, the majority, more than 50%, I can't remember the number, uh, I think it's in the upper 50s, uh, supported red flag laws. So the uh, the majority of Republicans, independents, and Democrats in my districts favor red flag laws and, um, and safe storage as well. So it's very clear the Republicans, will, even Republican, local Republican elected officials in Knoxville have contacted me 
and said you're doing the right thing. So you feel good walking around Knoxville. You're not people aren't shouting names at you, or you're or you're feeling you're safety. No, no, you feel people like are are thanking me. I mean, overwhelmingly, I regardless of what side of the aisle they're on. Um, I want to just go at a couple of Republican criticisms of you and let them uh, you, let you address them. Uh, the first one, uh, it, well, one of them's of, of you, and the other ones of Justin Pearson, which we'll get to in one second. Um, is I, I, you mentioned the fact that you've brought up red flag laws a couple times before? I talked to Justin Canoe over at Tennessee Holler and asked him to mm -hmm. do a little pre prep for this, and he was like, "Make sure that you get her about that. Like, this is not something that just happened, right? This is something she's been working on." Um, and and yet I, I see, you know, on these mega social media sites, like there was one meme I saw that really grossed me out, right? Which was you and, yeah. and the Justins like in front of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, gravestones of these kids, like acting as if you guys are trying to get, yeah. you guys are trying yeah. to get attention here. And I just, I, I would love for you just, you'd have an opportunity to talk about, you know, what, what is the real motivator here for, for you? The real motivator are those kids in those classrooms. Um, you know, right now, yes, we are being in the press, but we are being in the press because we are bringing attention to this issue. Yeah. And we have heard it. The, the young people are so great and they're so organized and um, they're going to keep this conversation going. We're going to build a movement. We're going to maintain it. And it's important to put this issue in the forefront. You know, they can do that, but it, we are doing it for those kids and for that staff. And all of us have had friends, have lost friends to gun violence. And that's what we're about. Um, we're also bringing to the forefront an issue that the majority of all of our districts care deeply about. The people who elected us want us to talk about this issue and they want us to speak up any way we can. They have told us that. Now, you know, what people don't understand is Justin Pearson's district is a, a deep blue, easily democratic district that has seen so much gun violence. Justin Jones, his district in Nashville is also a deep blue democratic district where gun violence is prominent as well. I'm in deep red, East Tennessee, yeah. and still yet, my constituents want me to talk about gun violence. You know, if they hadn't messed up and kept me there, right now there'd be a Republican in my seat. The, the mayor had already said he was going to appoint a Republican, and our county commission is nine Republicans and two Democrats. And so um, I just, it's really strange that somehow they messed up on my vote mm. and, um, <clears throat> but that we would have lost a seat had that been the case. And you guys, it is, it's making a tangible difference. I mean, so what, what's your sense? So Bill Lee did actually do something, get off his ass and, um, they did pass yes. an executive order. You know, it's to me and you can, can't, can't ever know. Right. But right. of these guys wanted to, these guys wanted to silence discussion on this, right? Like they wanted to focus it on the trans yeah. issue, right? Like that's what they wanted to do. And and so had, yeah. had these things gone a different way, maybe Bill Lee wouldn't have acted. I don't know. What's your sense for the executive actions that he's taken? I, you know, I don't know. I think, I think that it has to be a lot about the thousands of people that have been showing up at the Capitol. You know, I yeah. give them the credit. Yeah, no. um, but I think when you you stand up for people and make a bold move to stand up for folks. They recognize that it energizes them and they want to keep, you know, it's easy to show up with a whole lot of people. And then, and then the, the issue kind of goes away in a few days. But I think a lot of what has happened has really built a bigger momentum. And we've got folks that are planning on being there all the time. Like when we get back Monday, uh, Reverend Barber will be there and there will be an event on Monday and on Tuesday. I know some Nashville musicians plan on bringing a letter to governor Lee. So, um, this is not going away and I'm just excited that I think that we are going to be able to maintain this movement until there is action.
I hope so. Um, I want to show you, Sebastian, do we have the Tucker clip? I'm sure you've seen this, but I'd like to get your reaction. This, this is just kind of, disp- this shows you where they're going with this. And I, and I yeah. think it's a sign of weakness. I want to bring everyone together, said Justin Pearson, in a voice that if you closed your eyes, you could easily imagine coming from a suburban orthodontist. Justin Pearson wasn't white. That's probably how he got into Bowdoin in the first place. But he did a fantastic impression of it. What a nice young man. Has he considered the apprenticeship program at Citibank? That was the old Justin Pearson before his transition. Uh, I mean, this was just a horrible person. (laughs) I mean, what, like... Sorry. Yeah, no, he is a horrible person. But what, like, what... You know, I I mean, is it... Do you hear this stuff? Like... Those comments were so racist. Like, he doesn't even care to say stuff like that. And, you know, it's it's interesting because, you know, we've talked about this. And uh, I haven't talked about it with Justin Pearson, but with other colleagues. And it's just like, eight years ago was different. You, you know, we do want to work across the aisle. We do right. want to listen to all opinions. That should be the goal. However, we are working with people who see us as enemies in a war room. Uh, so so your tactics have to be a little different. You know, we're going to have to speak firmly and loudly to these folks. And, and the idea that because somebody wants us all to come to the table and collaborate, there's nothing wrong with that. But these folks aren't interested. Now, this was a Christian school where the kids were dead, right? Like, it's not like the dead kids, yeah. like, are part of the what ostensibly should be the Tucker Carlson tribe in this war that they're imagining that they're in the civil war. Right, and it's like, right. you'd think that there'd be able to a moment. And after the Parkland shooting, Rick Scott, not my cup of tea. Right. Did, they signed a red flag law. They did something right. Like they met, they came to the table. They didn't do this. Now, eight years later, to your point, eight years later, you have the highest rated host on TV. His response isn't, Oh, maybe, you know, we can find some area of agreement with people across racial lines, across party lines. But instead it's like the one guy that speaks out about the shooting at the Christian school, I'm going to, I'm going to make fun of him and say that he's, you know, like make fun of uh, whether he's changed his accent and say that he only got into college because he was black. Like it's fine. It's sick. And, I, I, it's and you sick. See, yeah. And you see what our supermajority did the same thing that Tucker did, you know, verbally on his show um, our supermajority hears about this horrific shooting, six people dead, three children, three staff. And what is their first action? Their first action is to expel the folks who talked about it and forced a conversation. That's their first action, not to do something about gun violence, but to expel the members who spoke out. What, what about the race element of this? I mean, I, I just, again... I was a Republican not that long ago. I've heard racist stuff in my time, but even I was like clutching my pearls listening to, I forget which, what the guy's name was, the rep on the floor, you know, talking about how, how Justin needed to shut up and how he was, he wanted, he just was doing this for attention. I mean, like, uh, do you feel, do you ever feel that like that uh, kind of, I I don't know. Well, I I guess we'll just put it to you this way. Like the the racism of your colleagues, like, like, do you, is that something that, that Stan has they, stood out to every you? day, every single day you see it in committee, uh, the racism, misogyny, and they don't even, they're not even aware of it. It's, it, it's remarkable. Um, one interchange that representative Jones got into with representative Kumar was pretty much similar to something that happened in our government operations committee. And it, it was just a, 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 a lecture to representative Jones about acting like us and dressing like us and speaking like us, this whole assimilation thing. And it's just, it's, it's remarkable. And I was sitting in, in criminal justice committee, not a month ago, I guess, when they have a bill to bring back the firing squad and the electric chair. And then a member said, I love this bill. I, I think we should bring back hanging by a tree too. Jesus. And so he just advocated for lynching in committee. It was a year or two ago where where one of our members had um had raised his hand to speak and then he's he's always talking. So he gets in a conversation with somebody and the chairman of the committee calls on him to speak 
and he didn't hear because he was talking. And um, the the chairman said, "Oh, I think he's getting a recipe for fried chicken." How do these guys I mean, work with the these time. people? How do they work? I mean, how do you work with them? But like, how do the how do Justins go back and? I, I mean, I, you guys have other business that's not this yeah. hot, yeah. right? Like, how do you even do regular order, you know, roads and bridges business with these people after hearing fried chicken and noosing and all it, this stuff? It's it's really hard because we know what's in their hearts. We hear the we imagine what they say in private, but when you actually hear it on audio recording, it's jarring. And, and we go, I'll go back to work. We all will, but we're going to speak up and we're not going to stop. And you saw that both of the Justins, when they got reinstated, they went back in and they went hard. And we're not going to stop doing that because it's what's right. And what people need to understand, we acted because it was just in our hearts we had to go to that well. We didn't plan it. We had talked about maybe some sort of action we could take, like John Lewis, who sat in on the floor of Congress, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. But we just really, at that point, none of us could just keep that in, that we felt we had to recognize those people. And that's what we did. And for them to say we did it for attention is outrageous. They gave us the attention because they wouldn't stop cutting our mics. Um, I want to just do two other things really quick, then I'll let you go. Um, the um, one, the first is related to this. I, I saw you mention this. I just wanted to hear more that you went to Columbine after the shooting. So I grew up about a mile from Columbine. I would have, I went to okay. Jesuit high school. I would have gone yeah. to Columbine um, and, um, and, and knew some folks there. And um, so obviously that was just an, an, a formative time for me but the, one of the ways in which it was formative was that it was so unusual right like that's why right, it made right. like made yes. such a big deal right and, mm-hmm. and i just i sometimes think about my my 16 year old 17 however old i was your old self and think like if you would have told me that i'd be 40 20 years later and that this would be mm-hmm. happening all the time and that nobody would have done anything i think i would have thought everybody was insane and crazy and yeah. so anyway i'm curious to you for you just to hear about your experience going there and, and how like that perspective has shifted over time. Yeah, it was it was really fascinating, and to see the difference how Columbine and how how Jeffco, which is the school system I was teaching in, um, was oh, so you different. Were living there how they, then. yeah, I didn't realize that. Which school yeah. were you teaching in? At Dakota Ridge. Oh, at Dakota Ridge. Oh, okay, yeah, I wasn't so far from it. I was at Dakota Ridge. Who got some some of the students that couldn't go back to Columbine came to Dakota Ridge. Okay. And, and so they either went to Dakota Ridge or Chatfield if they didn't want to go back to Columbine. And so I was at Dakota Ridge and I'd come from this great program in Knoxville where we addressed mental health. We had counselors in the room, um, just a fabulous program. So once I got there, I realized they really need a program like this that addresses mental health. So I wrote a grant for a program similar to what we had in Knox County and they gave it to me. And um, so we created a class that had that um, that in it, you know, that that element of mental health and all of that. But it was really, really necessary there. And it's necessary everywhere, quite frankly, even in regular ed. But um, that's what I did there. And it was very helpful to to because for me, with my kids and whenever I've been able to get there, their head right, I guess, you know, we'll talk about those mental health issues. They learn quickly. It's, it's just, you know, they've got to have the ability to talk about what's going on at home or, or whatever to um, be able to dive into the studies. And so that's what this classroom was able to do. And it's always been successful. When I was at Central, my graduation rate in my high school, in my special ed classroom was higher than the school's graduation rate. Because we were able to address mental health issues as we were doing our academics. So do you see a difference in the kids? I mean, just, I mean, obviously mental health issues, are, trauma is trauma. But like from yeah. that first Columbine experience to now, I mean, because now these kids that come up are living through, you know, drills and all that. I just wonder if what, yeah. you, you know, if yeah. you see any change um, over time. I guess like kind of like you said, I see that it is more prevalent in their thought, you know, that because there have been so many since Columbine, it is it is 
in the front of their mind, not in the back of their mind. You know, I think that it's just, God forbid, becoming a normal thing that we have to deal with. And it's absolutely not normal. Um, I didn't know you were over at Dakota Ridge. I was at Regis. We were so close to one another. Um, we had an overlap back then. Um, okay, so uh, just one other issue I wanted to talk about. Um, uh, abortion is another one that there are some extremes, and I, I think maybe some on the, some of the particulars we might have some, some some maybe some differences, but that's good, right? You can be able to talk across yeah, certain differences. Yeah. But there was one particular issue, or I want I wanted to talk to you about, um, which is you know this question related to uh, you know uh, life of the mother. And issues in, right. in, in Tennessee law. And, and I guess you had an experience, you know, when you were 21 uh, with uh, with a medical, you had a medical abortion, you mm-hmm. spoke about that. And, and and now I think some of the laws in Tennessee, you know, that are just so draconian. It's one of these things, that, again, like right. again, eight years right. ago, eight years ago, it's like, oh, you know, maybe there'll be a 20 week ban with exceptions. And we can agree and disagree on 20 week ban with exceptions. That's very different than a six week yeah. ban with, with right. you know, letting a literal death panel decide whether a mom can get an abortion or not, you know, if she has right. a medical right. issue, right? So, so talk to that, you know, kind of the extremism and how that and your experience with that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's terrifying to me that right now we have no exception for life of the mother, zero. We are working on an exception, which is the, the original exception written by a Republican who is a physician was a decent exception for life of the mother. I would vote for it. The right to life guy has rewritten it, and it's virtually nothing again. It's only ectopic pregnancies and dead fetuses. And so um, in my kitchen, my situation, I would have died with right now with people who have cancer and are pregnant. What are they going to do? It's not going to account for that. And, and so it's remarkable that they will sacrifice women to um, to make sure that these uh, that these fetuses are, are brought to term. But it's horrifying to me as far as I'm concerned. Women in Tennessee are second-class citizens. We do not have equal rights. If we don't have bodily autonomy, we do not have equal rights. And um, the fact that women are going to be dying, young girls are going to be dying, the idea that we're forcing nine-year-olds to carry a pregnancy to term horrifies me, horrifies me. They won't let them learn about, about Martin Luther King in school, but they will force them to carry a pregnancy to term. Crazy. Um, well, we could do two hours, unfortunately, on all that. You had a great thread a while back. Uh, it was maybe last year. It just shows you, and it's gotten worse, like just about all the extreme yeah. stuff going through the Tennessee legislature. And it's like, it's hard to keep track of, but I don't know if you have one, and, one and broader we, comment we, of that before I let you go. And, and we haven't even talked about all the um, indictments and all the federal investigations and all the horrific things that are going on right now. We have a speaker who doesn't live in his district who is um, per- accepting per diem every week from the district he doesn't live in. He, he now lives in, in Davidson County. If you live within 50 miles of the Capitol, you're not supposed to get all that per diem, but he's getting it saying he lives in Crossville and he does not. But we're the ones who get expelled for speaking without permission. Well, as this goes back to the drunk with power, right? It's like they, they yeah. feel like they can yeah. do what they want. They can say racist stuff mm-hmm. and they're not going to get called on it. They can, you know, sh- silence you guys. are not going to get called on it. They can take, you know, they can be corrupt, play inside baseball because they're not going to get called on it. And that's why people need to right. actually vote. I mean, this is what it comes down to, right? Is getting, you know, mm-hmm. the folks who, who understand this and who maybe. You know, so what, what the bulwark and what our work has been all about, right? Who maybe might have some ideological yeah. differences with Democrats, but say this is too far. Like these guys have gone right. way, like unbelievably right. off the deep end on a wide variety of issues on corruption. And hopefully we can unite some of those folks together. Thank you for doing this. We have a tradition on the Sunday show. We do a couple fun rapid fire questions. I'm going to do them really quick. It's been serious topics, but you know, we got to leave people on a Sunday afternoon with a little bit of a, a, a lighthearted note. So I want you to give me your Tennessee Mount Rushmore of Tennessee, of people who are Tennessee famous people, residents, heroes, you know, people that inspire you. I'm, I'm, I'm giving, I'm explaining this a lot so you can think you got to have a couple, you have to, you have to give me your top tennis, Tennesseans, your top volunteers. What do we call, what do we call people live in Tennessee? Tennesseans? Yeah, volunteers. I, I would have to go with um, Dolly Parton, obviously, the obviously. obvious choice. 
Yeah. Pat Head Summit. Um, Great choice. I was going to I was going to nominate Pat Summit if you didn't. So I'm going to have you go in there. <laughs> uh, Elvis. Elvis. Um, and Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells. That's good. I would have gone with T. Martin um, winning that well, uh, national team. Tina, Tina Turner, Turner's have- Tennessee. Oh, okay, boy. All right, we'll 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 put we'll, we'll put five bus up there. Okay, favorite Dolly song. Favorite Dolly um, song. Jolene. Jolene, it's got to be Jolene. Uh, it's such a good such a, such a good one. Potential new boyfriend is a sleeper for me though. Love potential new boyfriend. Okay, last question. <laughs> um you you spent you were born in colorado right and spent some time working in colorado right. so i'm a coloradan so i need you to give me one area in which colorado is clearly superior to tennessee i don't want to get you in trouble at home but you know yeah um well you know it's really fascinating because it's, it's absolutely beautiful i mean the mountains are beautiful yeah. um but the mountains are so different than our mountains here right. so yeah. people want to compare our mountains are better than their mountains yeah. but they're different but the Rockies are spectacular. You know, um, uh, we have older mountains here. They're greener. Um, so it's a different kind of beautiful. But the Rocky Mountains are, are I, I, spectacular. I used to go up to Mount Evans. It was one of my favorite places. I would go on to, up to Mount Evans on the weekend to do my planning. I'd just take all my stuff up there, find a spot, and just do my planning, school planning for the week up at Mount Evans. So. No, no, this is great. I, I, the the cheat answer would have been Jared Polis is the is the is the one thing that's better about Colorado than Tennessee. You'd be <laughs> no, doing, you'd really, be better I off was, with Jared I, Polis. I really like the Mike the Headless Chicken um, uh, story. If that's one of my that's what it Fruta. That's the name of the town. Yeah, yeah Fruta. But, yeah. If you don't know, do you know Mike the Headless Chicken? I don't know the Mike story? the Headless Chicken though. I've been to Fruta. You can check it out. It's 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 iconic. It's fabulous. All right. um, a chicken well, that they cut the head off and he didn't die and they took him around on tour without his head across the country <laughs> and, and there's and there's a statue from like the headless chicken in the in the town okay i'm i'm, I'm while i'm i'm googling madly right now but i'll have to do this afterwards <laughs> to learn about michael's head the chicken thank you so much as they uh as the uh as the Rocky Top lyric goes, uh, wild as a, as a mink, but sweet as soda pop. Do you feel like that's going to be a <laughs> yeah. uh, representative Gloria Johnson going forward? Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for all doing right. this. I'm so grateful for spending Absolutely. all this time. We, we really admire you. I know that our listeners will be very happy to get it. And, and hopefully we can please stay in touch. Um, doors always open here at the Absolutely. Bowler. Yeah. And uh, right. uh, I'm with you uh, unless you're playing against LSU. All right. We'll talk to you all later. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Gloria. And we'll see you next time. We'll see you back on Wednesday at the next level.